Well, hi, everybody. Uh, Stephen Van Tassel here, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife. We have a special guest here, Mr. Smith. It's a Duff Smith. Is that, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about all things cats. Yes. House cats, feral cats, free range cats, cats, the nemesis of many individuals out there. And of course, you have the cat mafia that are constantly trying to get more cats out and onto the streets for whatever reason. Uh, we're going to talk about cats today. And so we're talking to Mr. S- Mr. Smith here out in the great state of Florida. So welcome to the Pesky Podcast. It's great to be here. Thank you for having all right. me. All right. Well, tell us uh, tell us a little about yourself out the Pest Geek world. Well, uh, I did what I did with the cats on a volunteer basis, and then as a favor for a few friends. And doing it professionally would be uh, would involve some flaming hoops where I live. I mean, a lot of people aren't cool with the idea of uh, trapping cats or even taking them to the pound, where our animal control director lady. Uh, make some very professional decisions as to what to do with the cats. Yeah. And uh, gets a lot of them adopted out, actually, but uh, uh, that's not good enough because she doesn't meet uh, no kill criteria. And she right. has a message on her main website uh, explaining about responsible sheltering. And uh, so she, having her as an animal control director was pretty critical. Um, I don't know what I could have done without somebody who was, uh, you know, um, committed to being open intake at my local shelter. And that's becoming rarer and rarer now in the U.S., isn't it? Where you have, everything's gone, almost no kill shelters, isn't it? Yes. And, uh, you know, the the place where I live is uh, Key Largo, Florida. It's the Florida Keys. And we have these island habitats with their incredibly diverse, uh, plant and animal composition the species composition here is really uh very unique and important it's all the way at the very southern end of the united states in a tropical habitat and uh you know you just got to take care of those habitats and those ecosystems that are all the way out on the fringes of a continental ecosystem because you know climate change or whatnot you know i mean if uh, species have to colonize new areas because climate change is forcing them to. I mean, you don't want to get rid of the animal species and plant species that are all the way on the fringe of your continental ecosystem there. That okay. You to, yeah. All right. So it's explain so, a little bit. You, so you've talked here about the the need for protecting these species. So how does, how does cat control or cat removal play into that? Well, I learned a long time ago uh, when I used to like to go looking for snakes and stuff, and I would have loved to find a skink where I grew up in uh, the Mid-Hudson Valley in New York State. Mm -hmm. Uh, I came to figure out that everywhere you go hiking in the woods and you see people's cats going everywhere, you don't find anything. They they pick the environment clean Mm -hmm. of all of its snakes. Uh, a lot of it's native rodents that things like the uh, barred owls and stuff use for food. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, cats are just, um, you know, they're appealing. They're appealing. I had three cats myself, but it was a very tough realization for me that, uh, you know, that the animal that I cared about or said that I cared about, you know, it, it brought home a garter snake one day and that changed me. Mm. You know, I came to realize, you know, this, this was a mistake trying to tell my parents whatever it took to tell them that I wanted to keep this cat and I wanted to, you know, I was going to do, take all this responsibility for the cat. And I, I used to be of the same mentality as a lot of the people that wound up making threats against me Mm -hmm. right here in Key Largo. So, uh, you know, it was a hard realization that, uh, cats as appealing as they are, are just a force of extermination when they're not, when you don't take complete responsibility for where it's going there's a public health issue with it wherever it's going to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, they spread something like 40 diseases to people and not super rare diseases either. I mean, common things like cat scratch and toxoplasmosis and toxicara, you know, they infect the eyes, the toxicara, okay. and the, you know. Well, let's, t- let's explore that a little bit more. You talked a little bit about, so you're think complete responsibility for the cat. What does that what does that mean? Does that mean that someone needs to not own cats anymore? Does it mean that we need to eliminate all cats from society? Or what, what do you mean by that? 
Well, the way I was keeping my cat is I was letting it outside. Mm-hmm. I was letting it outside. My stepmother protested that at first because she said it was going to kill her birds. And I said, no, it won't. I'll feed it and it won't do that. And I just had it all worked out in my head where it was going to work out. And what I actually needed to do was have uh, keep it inside, take very good care of it inside. And uh, a catio would have been nice somewhere where the cat could go outside but not be all the way outside where it's unrestrained. Mm. You know, uh, and now the way I look at adopting a cat, I mean, it seems like a good thing to do, but there's some people out there that need to get the message that the world already has enough cats. And I feel like I feel like if I were to adopt a cat again, that I would just be subsidizing this this situation where people think they can just pump out cat after cat. And it may yeah. it would stop me from actually adopting a cat right now, even though. Like I said, I find them to be perfectly appealing animals. You know, they're great for entertainment and companionship, but they're not filling that role when they're running outside, going wherever. Right. Okay. So that's so you're so you're advocating that people, if they want cats, they need to keep them indoors or somehow restrained so they don't have what I would call free range cats, because whether it's feral or free range, it's still ravaging the wildlife. It is, and and some people think it, they're great rodent catchers or whatever. And uh, the thing is, is they kill snakes also, and that's that's what I found out. Is uh, like even your common garter snakes and black racers that you a lot of people have in a lot of parts mm-hmm. of the country. They eat they eat rodents. They'll go and find a rodent nest with a bunch of babies in it and swallow it, and you never see it happen. But cats get loose on the landscape; they devour all the snakes. They go after snakes way harder than mice. And it's uh, and for some reason, everywhere you see cats, I mean, you don't see a lack of rodents. There, right. the rodents are still there. Oof. Yeah, the the mythology is pretty strong there. Uh, so, how do you so explain what some of the control when you were you said you were involved in a control event uh, down in uh, Key Largo, I'm assuming, or somewhere in that vicinity. How did that How did that go? How did it start? What was the process that you used? Um, I first noticed that there was this person who was the cat people's guru and he was their main spokesman and he would write editorials to the newspaper. And I saw him next to a grocery store surrounded by 60 cats, just 60 cats, just squirming all around him, their tails sticking straight up. Meow. It was just this, it was like this cat blob that was around him. They're just heaving mass, like breathes in and breathes out going, Meow, meow. Wow. I was just, it was so ghastly that uh, that was the first thing I noticed. The second thing that happened was my mother had already been involved in trapping cats around her house because she she liked birds. Right. And there there was were people on the next street. This guy who I saw at the grocery store lived on one block over to the north. And there was another guy living one block to the south. And it was the guy one block to the south. I got in a conversation with one day and he said something bad about my mother. And when I was talking to him face to face and I tried to tell, I let on to him, well, you know, that's my mother you're talking about. And she got, and he just went on about dropping my mother's name like he didn't wow. hear me or okay. he didn't care. At that point, I felt like saying something to him, I, but I didn't say what I felt like saying. And I just kept my silence and I resolved you know, myself in the future. Okay. I study biology. I know this is a problem. I even might know how to solve it. And I'm not going to let on to anybody that I'm going to solve it. I'm going to make my plan and I'm going to, I'm going to make a difference in this town. Mm. And, uh, and I did, I didn't say what I felt like saying to that guy. Cause I didn't want to tip him off. Cause I right. know, I know how those people are. I mean, they, you know, they, they consort with one another on how to get that person. They don't like, run over the garbage cans in front of their house or whatever. And, uh, you know, I knew I needed to make a plan. I was going to have to have some guts, um, you know. Okay. So that was the situation. You had, uh, obviously, a feral cat advocate in your community. It's so 60 cats. That is a staggering number of cats in one spot. Uh, just so one what was, spot. He had several. Just, Oh my gosh. And so now what was the, what was the process that you went through to start the control or what what happened? What was the process you went through? Um, I volunteered uh, doing habitat restoration near a, uh, a nearby public area that was under, you know, government jurisdiction. It was Mm -hmm. government property and they had conservation work days where you could go and work on restoring the habitat, you know, removing debris, 
Uh, we had this endangered uh, mammal. We got this endangered mammal here at Key Largo called the wood rat. And we oh, did right. supplemental yeah. nesting structures. Yeah. Yeah. I, Ralph DeGainer is the big conservation guy who is uh, involved with uh, conserving the wood rat. And I've actually met Ralph. I've had that honor. And, uh, you know, and he actually told me some trapping techniques that he used mm -hmm. on the refuge. Told me nice. some techniques to use, like concealing the traps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then you were, so how many cats were ultimately removed during this, during your trapping event? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I took, I took a lot of them to the pound. I took mm -hmm. uh, probably around 30 cats to the pound myself. Wow. Wow. And, uh, but there were other people doing it too. And mm -hmm. uh, I decided I was going to be kind of the lightning rod for the cat people during okay. all this. I was going to let them direct their anger at me. And I was going to get a camera in front of my house and possibly catch their antics on my camera. And uh, they drove by my house a lot. You know, mm -hmm. they, they would do these little ride bys and I recorded them on my camera. They even did it in the middle of Hurricane Irma. Um, and... <laughs> They, they were the only car that came down the street all day while I'm watching the trees just boom, boom wow. on uh, camera. And, and he comes down the street with this one other guy who was a convicted felon, didn't even have a driver's license, wasn't supposed to be on the road. And they came down the road together. It was wow. another guy who had accosted me over my views on the cats. And uh -huh. uh, so, you know, and there were no cops. There were no cops for like a week before that or a week after that right, and i right. thought i was going to be on my own fighting those guys you know keeping them off my property and uh that's all they did fortunately you know, on that occasion they rolled by like they were playing at something or and how did you and so what was the rationale so you became the lightning rod so what exactly were you being interviewed by the newspaper did you find yourself on tv was it just online no or no, they uh, the reporters didn't have a lot of interest in in me. It would always be the conservation guy who did it for the refuge, uh, mm -hmm. Ralph DeGainer. Okay. And I um, I drew a lot of the attention of the rank and file cat people who, okay. you know, do their dirty deeds, done dirt cheap or whatever to anybody, you know, they don't like. And that way, the people near the top of that heap, you know, don't have to can you know admit right. responsibility for some of the things the lower ranking people do who uh you know have certain <laughs> um things going on with their personality that are pretty scary yeah and so you know? what was what do you think is the reason i mean why is the passion for this free range cat thing why is why is it so intense have you had any thought about that my own thoughts are you know what i read about toxoplasmosis and how it can change the brain of rats and mm -hmm. uh, some have suggested, it's been hypothesized by experts, that yeah. this toxoplasmosis protozoal parasite actually gets into the brains of humans and modifies their behavior too. And there's been studies that said um, people who are seropositive, who test positive for the antibodies in their blood for toxoplasmosis, yeah. um, have a higher rate of mental illness like schizophrenia or mm -hmm. obsessive mm -hmm. compulsive disorder yeah. and i gotta believe it after talking to a bunch of people that i knew could not possibly have avoided infection by this stuff because of their constant contact i think the guy who fed next to the grocery store at one point was doing this technique that i heard about online where he was actually smearing you know the cat feces on himself to try to get the feral cats less afraid to approach him or whatever and oh that's, my gosh and this was how he got kicked out of the grocery store next to where he was feeding and was not allowed to go in there. Oh, my uh, word. I have not that, heard that. That is, that is what he smelled like. And I swear I remember reading on this one website about feral cats as I started to begin my research that somebody was advising you could smear it on yourself and the cats would be less afraid of you. And and this, this is what I heard about this guy is that oh he gosh. smelled like it. He smelled like it, and he was kicked out of a grocery store for uh, smelling like that. Okay, boys so. and girls, we need to probably just do a little uh, public service announcement here. Do not smear cat feces on your body. Um, yeah. So let's in, don't do that. Poo is bad. This is one of my favorite with among my quotes that I when I do my teaching. Poo is bad. Don't touch that. 
So um, and cat poo is no different here. So uh, don't don't do this. Uh, yeah, don't don't do this. This is not recommended. This is what someone was doing. All right, we want to make sure we don't get sued <laughs> for, for this type of information. So uh, sorry for my interruption there. Right? Yeah, yeah really. c- continue going. All right, so keep going. Okay, so um, you know, uh, I set the traps in the woods. I set a bunch of traps and. Uh, I had to conceal the traps for sure. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it gets rainy around here and I had to put these like sheet metal covers over the tops of the traps, but then they okay. were a little harder to conceal. Uh, the cats had more of a tendency to go in there when the traps were concealed. And of course they were harder to see for the kind of people that I had to worry about taking my equipment. And I right. lost something like 12 traps, you know, and wow. new ones would be donated to me. I had to tell my friends where I was going, what I was doing. So there were other people who knew about what I was doing and yeah. every time word got down the grapevine that I had, I was missing some traps, new ones would just show up on my property. Uh, wow. So people weren't going to let me run dry of traps. There were people that really wanted this done. So let's talk about the, talk about your traps. What did you have a particular favorite trap that you were using and what size was it? Um, I had a variety of, uh, drop down, uh, traps, the re- like the typical habitat style traps, two, but two the door best, or single door, uh, both. I was using both and, uh, the single door, uh, the double doors would sometimes only one door would shut. So it's a matter of like, you got to sandpaper the, the tarnish off yeah. of the moving parts that, uh, contact one another. Uh, it probably yeah. helps to wax them a little bit. Yeah. Uh, try not to use a real aromatic type of oil or whatever because I was I was very worried about smells. I was always wearing rubber gloves or just making sure my hands were clean and not sweaty every time I handled the parts. And before I like left the trap, I I put the scent of the food on my hands and then on the trap. But okay. uh, you were saying what type of traps and uh, yeah, the the double doors. I would often open just one of the double doors, the one that's uh, okay. got the linkages directly to the 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 tray. Yeah, the trip plate, and uh, then there so were the, some. So those oh, were the two door. So just to bring our audience up to speed, those were the two door, the old fashioned two door have a heart traps, gravity doors. So they were done. They were they closed by gravity, not spring loaded. So did you use any spring loaded doors? Some of them might have been spring loaded. I believe some of them did, or at okay. least on the part that locks the trap, the part that pops out and locks the door in place. Okay. That definitely had the spring loading. And there was one double door uh, trap that had, um, there was one design where the door came out a lot, qui- it came down a lot quieter. And so that was a real good one. Guillotine door or a diagonal door? Uh, diagonal door. Diagonal door. Okay. So you had a, a traditional 10, well, a, a more recent spring loaded door, probably 10 by 12 by 32 in size for that, for that single door trap. Probably a 1079. Uh, yeah. Mostly yeah. those. Some were okay. slightly smaller and, uh, the cats were slightly smaller a lot of the time. So, okay. uh, but the big ones, the big ones could accommodate, uh, like the biggest Tom cats too. So. Yeah. Okay. I definitely prefer the bigger ones. So when you were covering them, you covered them with a uh, a metal uh, a metal cover. And did you do anything to the floor of the trap to shield the the mesh from their feet? Yeah, I would throw leaves in there. Um, okay. I have used uh, newspaper also at times, All right. but uh, usually a lot of leaf litter because that was part and parcel to concealing the trap because the sure. mesh on the bottom of the trap was just as big a tip off um, as the mesh on the top. You know, so so usually a lot of leaves. And what was your favorite bait? My favorite bait, uh, let's see. That was, um, I usually used uh, canned cat food, and I prefer okay. to get a can of uh, cat food that came in like a plastic can instead of a metal, because when you're carrying the cat out, the metal can just rattles around like a, you know. Oh, Okay. Yeah. It, so what? Uh, so a plastic. I'm not. I was just in a store. I haven't noticed any plastic containers. What brand? Do you remember the brand? Fancy Feast. Fancy Feast is pra- plastic. I did not know that. So I learned. Okay. Fancy yeah. Feast. Any particular uh, meal? Fancy Feast, or just any Fancy Feast meal was working for you? 
Um, I grabbed I grabbed a variety, but mostly the the seafood and the chicken. Okay, seafood chicken. And yeah, did you and that's chum them? Made it food. Did you oh, chum, chum them, or did you have make them go all the way into the trap before they got some food? I uh, I made them go all the way into the trap for the food, okay. and then I would put a small pile of catnip in front of the trap, oftentimes because it. Uh, you know, they're attracted to the catnip and they eat that. And then they're a little less careful. It has whatever effect catnip has on the cats. And they are, they're not as careful, you know, when once they've had a little bit of catnip. And, and then so sometimes the, I use catnip as the bait. Was that oil form or powder form? Uh, dried, uh, minced up powder. Okay. The powder form. Okay. And how much yeah. were you putting, putting down? Like a teaspoonful. Teaspoon? Or uh, maybe more if I was just trying to get the cat uh, attracted to the trap. Uh, if I used it as the bait and put the catnip all the way in the back of the trap with nothing else, it was more like a tablespoon. You know, I okay. really, uh, yeah, because I want them to go for it. And, now, did, you, and using it, did you leave the traps out several days before you began to bait, before you began to set them? Or did you set them and bait them immediately? I would set them and, and bait them immediately almost every time uh, because uh, letting them sit out there, uh, letting them sit out there would make them a target. I mean, okay. there's, I felt there were people always looking for them. Yeah. I did, however, sometimes when, because the pound wasn't open on the weekend, sometimes I would leave the traps in place and jam a stick in there and then trigger the trap so that it was being held open by the uh, sturdy stick. Mm -hmm. uh, Near the top where the door was held open so they could go yeah. in and out of the trap maybe steal some bait all weekend long and uh there was something else about that but uh yeah I, I made sure to trigger the trap so it was the stick keeping the door from slamming shut instead of the trap plate the trip plate and the stick because that way if they go in there and try the trap out they'll hit that trip plate and it'll make a noise and spook them out of there and that'll make them less inclined to go in the trap so that was the one of the fine uh, details i had to i had to work okay. out there i got you so the so if you had to do it over again because when i've you know in terms of my publication what i've what i've suggested people do and this you know it's not just me i guess it's what would be other people who have a lot more experience than even i do would be that if you're in a that if possible to pre-bait your traps wire the doors open so the doors don't close or to get them conditioned to moving into the traps and do that for a little bit before you ultimately set and then of course you know your situation was different because you were in a hostile environment rather than a controlled environment and so your situation was a lot more difficult uh, but if you're in a more, if you were in a controlled environment, would you have gone about this a little bit differently, like in terms of pre-baiting first and having lots of traps available and then set them all at once after several days, uh, rather than having to, you know, the kind of cloak and dagger approach that you had to take, which was quite stressful, of course. Hmm. Would you have done that? Yeah, I would have left the traps in place and uh, I would have gotten the cats used to feeding there. And then when the the cats uh, come out of the trap after eating. They probably sniff each other's face, kind of like rodents do, and try mm -hmm. to sniff what each other's been eating. Ah. And that, yeah, I think that would have like a kind of social chain reaction that would be good between the cats, and it would. I think that would help draw them into the traps definitely. How did uh, the how did things go legally? Many communities across the United States treat cats as a domestic animal. That even if the cat is truly feral. So let's define something for our audience here. And that is you, you have owned cats that are free range where the cat is going out, killing all the wildlife they can find and then coming back to the house. That cat is owned and even cared for. It may have its shots. It may have a collar on. That's a free range cat. It's still killing stuff, but it's someone is actually owning that cat. Then you have a true feral cat, which is a, a technically an unowned animal but it's out ravaging the world. You may have people feeding this animal, but if the cat does something wrong, they claim it's not theirs. And if you do something to the cat, they claim it's theirs. <laughs> so <Yes>. um, <laughs> heads you win, no. tails you lose. Uh, heads, uh, so this is where, 
So you have to make sure that if you're going to be doing cat control, you find out what the status of cats are in your area because typically cats are treated as domestic animals and domestic animals are by definition owned, even if they're not owned, they're owned. And so that means if you're going to go into cat control, you better make sure you get all your dots in a row because if you have someone, if someone's cat ended up getting killed and you thought it was feral and they claim it was theirs, you're going to have some liability involved because it's a property issue at that point. Does that sound about right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. They, they tried all those tricks in the book. Um, and the first time they called the cops on me for being in their woods, uh, <laughs> you know, and they did. Um, the cop was pretty cool. I mean, I, I explained to him that, yeah, it's public land that the cat guy doesn't own and I don't own it either. And right. uh, but the way I see it, he's not sterilizing, sterilizing all his cats. So he's farming cat on land he doesn't own. And I'm going in there and I'm taking him to the pound because they're not sterilized. OK, you know, they kept uh, in their public statements. They would kept saying they believed in trap, neuter, release and that they were working with whatever local animal agency. And then they would name the wrong one that's not in our town. But oh. they said they were working with them to get all the cats sterilized. And I would trap the cats and none of them would be sterilized. And uh, wow. Wow. there was there was even a situation where, uh, well, back to this first cop I had to deal with, though, because he when he spoke to the guy who called the cops on me. And this is the guy next to the grocery store who at one time smeared that stuff. But oh. he uh, he tried. He told the guy after speaking to him first, he said, you don't own the cats. These are not your property. You don't have a property claim to these cats because they're out living in the woods. You know, they're nobody's cats. And, okay. and that's how the cop looked at it. And that was that was fortunate for me because, yes. uh, you know, after all, there's limits on how many cats you're supposed to have. And right. uh, there's laws that say they can't trespass. There's even a law, a leash law in this town. But then there's other language in our municipal code that negates that leash law because. Really? Uh, oh, so you have, yeah. a, you have a contradiction. OK, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what you, ultimately you want a community where cats are they are have to be restrained and so then the process would be if you capture a cat then you would contact your animal control officer and the animal control officer would remove the cat and then the animal control officer would be responsible for finding the owner uh, so that's ideally what you'd want to do if your community is like that so i would certainly encourage all uh, pest geek podcast listeners if you're getting involved in cat control make sure you get all your Cross signatures and find out and I would certainly suggest that you don't personally kill any animal kill any cats ideally you want to bring those cats to animal control and hand that property over to them and you got to find out all that in advance before you start controlling so some communities you would be allowed to kill them most would treat them as domestic species uh, so you you got some research and then of course you may get false information from people that just will hate what you're doing so <laughs> so make sure you find the actual rules and find out uh, sometimes you can get the health department to give you a uh, an issue a demand to have cats removed i had one job that i did for a company where the health department actually ordered the cats to be removed that's about as your that's your get out of jail free card right there um, when you have health department orders. So do your due diligence, everybody, and, and look into this. Yeah. So tell, so now that you, now that this is done, would you do it again? Uh, I would love to do it again. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, you know, it's like this, uh, you know, with this pandemic shutdown and everything, I'm going to, I'm under some pressure as soon as it's, you know, as soon as everybody's allowed to move around and get in a job again, you know, mm -hmm. To, to go out and get some money. Although, you know, I could look into starting a possibly a vertebrate, vertebrate pest control service in my town. I could look into that. I could talk to the lady from animal control and ask her how that would go. Uh, I can tell you over the years, uh, some of the things, sometimes she acted a little bit like a TNR kind of animal control agency where she gave the cats back to the people who yeah. were doing these colony feedings. Yeah. And uh, the one good thing, though, even when it seemed like I was spinning my wheels with all that, 
uh, sometimes I got the cat people caught in a lie. And because I treated the cats so well, every time I caught them and took them out of the woods and covered the traps before I moved them and kept down their stress level, right. uh, I was able to catch the same cat more than once. And Wow. I, wow, that's pretty I, good. So I thought when I turned the cat in, catching the same cat more than once, that uh, I, was, I thought, you know, the the animal control lady was playing balls with the TNR people and just letting them do TNR and letting them let the cats loose again. But when I brought the cats back to the shelter, it would turn out that uh, they weren't supposed to re-release the cat into the same woods and they got in a lot of trouble and she stopped dealing with them as a result of my bringing her the same cat more than once. So even when it felt like I was spinning my wheels, I was actually still doing some good. That, that Excellent. Was, uh, yeah. So you don't have any uh, you don't have any vertebrate control in your community. So uh, my understanding of, of Florida law is that you can you can talk to uh, your wildlife agency down there and get your and get your permit to do wildlife control. So because uh, it's more to the world than just cats, right? You have raccoons and skunks and squirrels and mice, oh, yeah. you know, all the different vertebrates. And you may want to look into getting your pest control permit as well, which allows you to use pesticides. So um, there are de definitely ways to uh, to do that down there. Um, so when you were so you removed 30 cats, how did you protect yourself from getting scratched or or bitten while you were used taking picking these traps up? You just kept them all covered before you began to move them so the cat couldn't reach through the cage and scratch you. Yeah, some of them some of them were very mean and the handles the handles were all working on the traps and if they weren't I would have come up with a new one right away before trapping with it. Um, you can you can grab the trap at one end where the diagonal door keeps the animal away from your hand and you can grip it there and you can grip it from the uh, top handle. And uh, sometimes you got to work the top handle with a stick to get it up high enough off the trap that you can grab it with your hand. Right. Or, um, actually there's a plate there. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a plate. So you can grab that and the plate will protect your hand right where the handle is in the top center. So uh, that w and then I held it just away from my body. And that was a discipline remembering to hold the trap a few at least a few inches from my body because right. there's holes in the trap big enough for them to actually reach out and take a swipe. And uh, I've come pretty close to getting that cat scratch fever, just like uh, that one musician saying about, you know, yes, it's. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and something be... like 20. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say like 24% or something of cat bites. Some crazy double digit percent of cat bites require surgery for yeah. crying out loud. The infection, <laughs> the infection rate's really high because it's, they have such fine teeth and their flora, the flora in their mouth has so many bacteria in it. So it's like getting an injection of bacteria into deep deep tissue and so it's a real it's a real problem out there and so we our professionals our listeners are certainly know a lot about this stuff and so you can find your you can find that if you were buying if you were getting better equipment you would find the safety factor for you would go up enormously so but you were kind of you know making do with what you had available. So one of the things you'd want to look for is getting those traps that are half inch by one inch mesh, which are professional level traps. So you have retail level traps and professional level traps. So retail traps tend to have a one by one inch mesh and that allows the animal to get their foot through, right? So if you, if you get half inch by one inch mesh, it's a lot heavier because you're almost doubling the amount of wire in the trap but you don't have the ability, the animal, it's very difficult for most animals to get their foot through that. And certainly a cat would be very hard to get through that. So you find, we've learned this from raccoons. So, cause raccoons will reach through one by one inch mesh traps and they'll trash anything they can find within six inches of the trap, which is really a problem when you set the trap on the roof of a house, they will actually deshingle it. <clears throat> within mm. six inches of that trap. They will trash it. Um, the one guy I knew, he had a trap set near a garden hose and he forgot he was that close. And the raccoon the next day had the entire 50 foot line of garden hose inside the trap. <laughs> so you, this is one of the advantages, but if you, since you were covering, covering is a way, it's, a, it's sort of the poor man's way of, of, uh, 
of improving that trap because you basically stop the animal from reaching through by putting a cover on it. So a lot of us will use uh, cloth covers rather than metal covers. And that way they're easier to carry. You can stack them up, they're cheap. You just get some denim and then surge stitch the outside of it. And so you just simply wrap it over the top of the trap and just put some rocks or dirt on top of it so it doesn't blow away. And it's a very inexpensive way of uh, covering. But metal works too if you can afford it. So as you guys had, so it's pretty neat. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about some of the diseases you talked about. You talked about cat scratch fever. You talked about toxoplasmosis. Um, any others that people should really be concerned with? Yeah, there's, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head here, but, uh, there's, uh, like out West, the plague is endemic, uh, right. to some of the Western states and the, uh, the cats, if you read the articles of those unfortunate people who got these rare plague infections, I found that uh, it's more often than not their cat that spread it to them. And right. the cats, the cats even can develop the pneumonic form of plague where it would have been bubonic if you'd gotten it from a flea bite. But right, cats, right. They, they cough up bloody sputum and, and breathe in and out with bloody sputum on their mouth and nose and that's how people are getting pneumonic plague which is way more dangerous and contagious uh often from a cat i did and, not know that i knew that cats would go out because they're going after rodents as well i mean they're killing a lot of non-rodents a lot of your snakes and skinks and amphibians they're really hard on those on those species but if they catch a ground squirrel like in california it was a guy's cat brought it to him he, the guy the cat was probably out with ground squirrels, got a flea, and then maybe the flea got it. But you're saying, I haven't heard the pneumonic plague. So everyone just, plague comes in three different forms. In turn, it, primarily, it's classified by how it is spread. Um, so you have, uh, most of it's the bubon bubonic, where you get be flea bit, flea bite, and that bacteria enters your body through the skin, and then it forms, gets into your um lymph glands and that's where your body's trying to fight this bacterial infection that creates this large mass that's the bubo it's like a tumor sticking out of your body that's the bubonic but then what he mentioned here was the pneumonic plague which which is spread by droplets so if you cough then the, the bacteria is spread by the droplets and he's saying the cat can spread it spread pneumonic plague and i have not heard that which is quite scary yeah. Yeah, and another disease. I can think of one more because I brought a guy across the street from me home from the... Yeah, so it may have been pneumonic. And then you have another form which is spread by fluids, I believe, and that's obviously much rarer. Um, so at minimum, the cat can bring fleas home to you. And so I tell people, look, if the cat's out roaming around, whatever's out there in the wild can be brought home to you while you're petting it and letting it sleep in your bed. <laughs> So <laughs> that makes me think of one other disease, uh, yeah. another disease that you get off of fleas. And I brought a guy home from the hospital just across the street from me because he he got himself a kitten and he loved this kitten. But he was living a kind of a, a lifestyle in this house where he wasn't really supposed to be in there. He didn't have a sewer hookup. So he's kind of a squatter. Uh, OK, or the guy who was renting to there to him. There was kind of a slumlord there. But uh, yeah. You know, he, he had this kitten in the house and he was doing some unconventional things to keep his food good until he, uh, you know, felt like eating it. But he would leave mashed potatoes on this tabletop and there were fleas all over his uh, domicile there. And some of them jumped into his mashed potatoes and looked like pepper, you know, and they're on the fleas. There's these tapeworm eggs. Oh, and he, gosh humans can get the tapeworms and i wound up having to bring this poor guy home from the hospital one time and i told them look for feline tapeworms because i know what's happening to his mashed potatoes he's getting those fleas in his mashed potatoes he wound up he, yeah. with a ravenous appetite just a ravenous appetite had to eat 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 and they found it sure enough they found it at the hospital his stepdaughter called me Gosh. and this is just this is just across the street from me and uh, this guy I was talking about feeding next to the grocery store, there was a children's playground just on the other side of the undeveloped lot right there. There's another playground behind the other grocery store where he had another colony. And what he finally got arrested for, for trespassing, he, that wasn't enough for him. He decided he was going to trespass on the public elementary school grounds 
instead of just the parochial school where he was given all the Catholic kids, you know, presumably diseases because they had sand in their playground. Right. And uh, so he was he trespassed onto the public school that was right near my house because he just had to bring his cats up against every children's playground. And when he wrote his editorials, he would talk about how if they you trap too many of his cats, that the kids weren't going to have cats to play with and stuff. So he oh so he had these obsessive thoughts about you know, his cats coming into contact with, you know, kids who happen to be immunologically naive to toxoplasmosis, most likely. I mean, it was like everything he did and everything he advocated was, I I say it like this, he was a cat lover second, and he was a infected feces distribution specialist first. When you really analyzed his behavior and try to think of why he would possibly be doing this, because he his cats weren't meeting any kind of humane outcome at all. If right. he had six cats in a colony or he had 60 cats in a colony, they had patches of fur missing. Uh, they looked awful and they all looked the same. And uh, one time he left the food that he was feeding them, the wet food, and it was sliced mm-hmm. up hot dog slices. And I smelled it and it smelled suspiciously like garlic. And so I researched that online. And some people apparently believe that garlic will keep fleas off of cats. But oh my gosh. I mean, when you really do your homework, you find out that garlic and onions and everything like it will give a form of leukemia. No, um, anemia. It will give a form of anemia to dogs and cats. So they don't get garlic and onions. But, uh, well, I think that my theory is a little bit different. I mean, I, you know, you're, you're talking about some of the disease factors that may be the infection with the toxoplasmosis parasite is causing some of these behavior change. I, I guess my theory is a little bit more psychological and sociological in the sense that and it doesn't necessarily mean they're mutually exclusive, right? It can be, it can be more than one option, but I, I just see that a lot of these people that tend to get so, uh, fanatic about cats or animals is because of a crushing loneliness in their life. And this is their way of trying to find meaning. And they they invest all of their social energy into an animal they think loves them back. Yeah. And so it's I look at it as a as a sadness that in and I, I I can't deny the potential of a disease factor. I mean, we're still learning about some of this stuff. Uh, we don't, you know, don't know, but I think at minimum, I just see that these individuals, and they typically tend to be older, they tend to be alone, and their kids aren't with them, or there's there's some sort of social estrangement. What do you think about that as, a, as an option? Uh, that could be it, although um, I believe I've seen people kind of withdraw, you know, and then get into cats. I mean, I'm not mm. sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I had I had one friend whose life was consumed by them. And uh, and I kind of watched that, and it was that's one of the things that made me more passionate about catching them because yeah. I felt I felt that she'd been infected by something infectious, and that uh, or that um, I felt that cats were like some kind of agent by which people are withdrawing. Mm-hmm. You know, I gotcha. So the question that I would have is whether that whether that individual suffered a, a social trauma, uh, maybe a hard breakup with a with a boyfriend or a girlfriend and or had some someone hurt them very deeply that caused that withdrawal um but you're thinking that that the cat is the effect where the the cat where the cat disease is the cause rather than the effect the reaction to that break um i think i think possibly yeah because uh one disease they say one mental health disorder they say occurs with toxoplasmosis more frequently with toxoplasmosis positive people is uh bipolar disorder and i like the stepdaughter of the uh man who got the uh the tapeworms in his gut Mm -hmm. actually had the guy next to the grocery store throwing food in her backyard when she was a kid attracting the cats into her backyard and and she had when i met her she had bipolar disorder Oh, and uh, and everybody who lived in houses around this guy's house on the next block seemed to be uh, affected that way. There seemed to be like a mental health cluster around the right. guy's house. 
So let's talk a little bit about how to, how does someone become infected with toxoplasmosis? Because we haven't mentioned that yet. So how does someone get this parasite? It's it's scary easy. It's scary Good. easy. And uh, the fact that uh, it has already caught on with some of the cat people that toxoplasma is a uh, disease that it, it's an organism that possibly forces people to love cats, or is at least one of the cat people, the, the lady who I knew whose life was consumed by cats, she knew this. And she spoke romantically in my communications with her about how toxoplasmosis forces people to love cats. <laughs> and uh, she likened it to this one character on Deep Space Nine who had like a parasite living in their belly that they communicate, were in constant communication with and stuff oh like that. Was, okay. She was into science fiction. Wow. She was into science fiction, which I appreciated that much about her. But yeah. uh, so, how just, do they, uh, so how do people contract it? How do they, how do they get the disease inside of them? Like well, the it's uh, the cat excretes it in the feces okay. and... Uh, it has to, about a day later after the cat excretes the feces. I took biology, by the way. I never introduced yeah. myself that way, but right. I did. And uh, the um, a day later, the the oocytes, the toxoplasma oocytes in the feces become active and uh, can infect about one day after. So if you clean your cat's litter box within 24 hours, you shouldn't be in any danger from it. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that 24 hours, and especially after the cat feces dries and has all that its cat hair in its composition and becomes crushed in any way, uh, when if you were to crush dry cat feces, you could just see the dust coming up off it if you get closer than you should ever get right. you know, to it. But uh, it breaks down and goes into the soil like in about uh six weeks in about six weeks you can't tell where the cat went to the bathroom even if it went on the surface or whether it buried it slightly you, you can't find the feces it's disintegrating into the environment but the oocytes from the toxoplasma uh remains active for 18 months later according to studies in most okay. environments uh environments that are favorable anyway not too dry you know and not too uh wet okay. but um do you have to eat it, it or do you, can you no. inhale it? No, it's not like that at all. I mean, if they if cats go to the bathroom in grass and you've got powdered cat feces in the grass, a lawnmower can pick it up and spew it into the air. There's many ways it can get aerosolized. Sure. And even just solar heating, solar heating on dirt can cause particles to lift, lift up off the dirt, like the size of those, those wow. toxoplasma sites. Okay. I worry about uh, I worry about the flies too, the gnats that breed in the feces and they hatch out of it, and then they land on everybody, they land on you and bite you. So, you know, it's all kind. There's all kinds of ways to get contaminated that way. And uh, lettuce, they keep having E. coli scares in lettuce, but I I do believe they're saying E. coli when it's other organisms, and they they're saying E. coli is a catch-all for other organisms because they they do that with drinking water too. They say, oh, E. coli turned up in the in the water, and uh, it's it, indicative. It is a diagnostic. Yeah, it is a diagnostic test. So to it, where it talks about other potential contaminants, but they focus on that could be. Yeah, that that could very well be. So where would someone find more information on toxoplasmosis? Where would you suggest they go look? Uh, there's actually a couple of good videos on YouTube, okay. and. Uh, then there's a Canadian equivalent of the uh, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. The Canadians have an equivalent agency, and they okay. publish what's called a pathogen uh, safety data sheet. And they published one on toxoplasmosis, and it goes into great detail. And uh, they talk about, I believe they talk about how it gets onto fruit as well, because when it gets into dust that blows on the wind, it tends to settle on the outside of fruit. And when mm -hmm. people pick a piece of fruit and bite into it without washing it first, right. uh, I, person, I had a coworker who tried something called a hog plum here locally, and he said it gave him diarrhea and uh, gave oh, him wow. headaches. And I told him what he probably had on that occasion, and... Uh, and that Ooh. coworker had some strange behavior too. I wound up having to leave that workplace because of that uh, coworker, even though I told him, "Hey, you could be under the influence of something you got infected with because it goes into your brain and stays there, and it changes your behavior in whatever way. You know, if it causes any behavior changes, they're permanent. They're permanent wow. until, unless you know, unless we find a cure, which we haven't found a cure yet, have we? 
No, they are investigating drugs that can suppress the activity of the uh, the cysts that get in the central nervous system, which are called bradyzoites. That's the life stage called the bradyzoite life stage. That's also the part, the life stage that gets into beef when you get it from eating undercooked toxoplasmosis from eating undercooked meat. It's not because cows spread toxoplasmosis like cats do. It's because they get infected when their grazing areas are contaminated, and then they swallow it, and they get it just like a person uh, where it the parasite doesn't breed sexually in their gut, but it burrows into their muscles and lodges in all their muscles and does some asexual reproduction in order to thoroughly lodge in all their muscles and get in great numbers. And that's how you get it from eating meat. Like one of the f cat people's favorite things to say is, oh, you get toxoplasmosis from eating beef and cats have nothing to do with it. But cats have everything to do with it. They're the ones that <laughs> contaminate the that's feeding funny. grounds with their feces. Well, and they're given the... the yeah, given the fact that most farm, most ranching communities have barn cats, uh, they're they're around, and I, I keep hearing s stories all the time from people. Well, we have barn cats, and they keep the mice down, and they, um, like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, it's it's one of those things. It's just it's like trying to push back at a wave. And my understanding is that most people in Europe contract their toxoplasmosis through there because it's very common to undercook beef in Europe. My understanding is. Uh, yeah, I imagine it is. I mean, that's, uh, cats are, uh, they're not native anywhere in the form that we've bred them into, but Europe used to have wild cats. And so it's not completely foreign to their environment, but of course this, this is like an invasive characteristic that has been bred into the cats. It just makes people want to have them around, want to pet them, want to feed them and subsidize their presence in the environment basically. So that there's many more of them there than there would ever be of a natural predator. Like, uh, you know, a lot of, there's a few predators actually that do that. They get a hold of garbage and they get a hold of pet food that people leave out and accessible and they just proliferate out of control. Like raccoons do that. And sure. They have, they have some of the same effect as too many as as cats have because sure. you know well thank you very much for uh spending some time with us on the pesky podcast living the wildlife so i'm gonna sort of close out here and hey everybody you want to thank want to thank mr smith for participating with us here and talking about cats if you are looking to get into cat control work do your homework, find out what the laws are, make sure you have a plan before you begin controlling, make sure you have confirmation that the cats you're capturing, uh, whether they're owned or truly feral, as opposed to just allegedly feral, uh, make sure that you are following all of the humane standards because the scrutiny on cats as a domestic species is enormous and there are what I call the cat mafia. There are these individuals who are just enamored with cats and are extraordinarily politically active. You don't want to be in the crosshairs of that uh, and have the liability of that type of work. So definitely try to be discreet, be professional, act in the best conditions, make sure you're checking your traps regularly according to the law. And I would say even if being more aggressive on that side, if you can do it more than once a day, you might want to consider doing that. Make sure you have permission to do the property. There's a lot of different steps to go through. Protect yourself. Make sure you're following all types of protocols to make sure you're not being exposed to uh, cat feces. And if you are, make sure you're, pro you're cleaning properly and you're making sure you're washing properly and you might want to make sure you're flaming flaming your traps to make sure before you're using them somewhere else because you might be transmitting some things elsewhere we've talked about flaming traps here before well mr smith we want to thank you very much for being with us here in the pest geek podcast and we hope that you do become a vertebrate controller down there if you need additional help do reach out to me we'll help you uh, get some information to make sure you get started on the right back hey everybody out in pest geek land uh we'd love to hear from you you can contact me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com would love to hear from you get your feedback do you have a topics that you're interested in and we are also looking for advertisers for the uh, living the wildlife podcast if you have a product a trap piece of tool that would be useful for people in the vertebrate pest world or the pest geek world 
definitely reach out to me again, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. And we're also looking for individuals who are interested in joining us and being a, a, an interview for our podcast. Definitely reach out to me. I would love to hear from you and talk talk to you more. We're pretty painless here at the Living, at Living the Wildlife podcast. Well, Mr. Smith, thank you very much. And we'll say goodbye to everybody. All Be right. safe.